I'm Claudine Close, the president of the Egbert Benson Historical Society of Redville. We are celebrating Women's History Month. It's nice to see a few men in the audience. Um, for those of you who haven't been in the inn before, uh, this is an amazing building. It was built about 1760. Originally as a farmhouse, it was then a stagecoach inn. And we know a lot about the history. And as I was thinking back on the history, there are all these mention of innkeepers, men. Men, men, men. And I know nothing about the story of women in this particular inn, so that's the next project, perhaps. Um, before I introduce our speaker, uh, I just want to announce that the Egbert Benson Historical Society has a program once a month. If you're not a member and would like to join, I have newsletters here, and um, it's just $15 for an individual. 25 for a family, but that way you're on our email list, you get newsletters, and you know about all these exciting programs ahead of time. Uh, in April, <laughs> Sunday, April 28th, we, our next program is the history of the public library, the Octagon Building, and the phrenologist Orson Squires Fowler, who, who kind of uh, popularized the Octagon Building movement, and it's uh, been researched and is going to be presented by actually our daughter and son-in-law. They're the team who did Ready Made Red Hook, if you, some of you remember the program from two years ago, I think. They're a great uh, historic preservationist team. So I hope you can make that. And then for those of you interested in local history, Red Hook history, Maynard Ham, our longtime history person, um, puts together these excerpts from the Red Hook Journal 1888, 1900, 1912. So you can read, get little glimpses of what life in Red Hook was like many, many years ago. Pick these up, they are available for anybody. But now that we have a full house, we can, uh, I'd like to introduce Jen Huber, who's going to do our program today. Jen was uh, one of the teachers that we had the great pleasure to work with during Red Hook's Bicentennial. And uh, I was really excited about her excitement about history and women's history in particular. So I asked her if she would be willing to do a program on women's history for Women's History Month for our historical society. She said yes, so I was thrilled. So she's been hard at work in our archives and I'm sure at home too. So Jen, it's all yours. Thanks, everybody. So uh, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, we made it out today. My name is Jennifer Huber. I was born and raised here in Red Hook. Um, and like Claudia said now, uh, teach social studies at our local high school. I've always been really intrigued by our rich culture of our town. I heard stories as a child um, from my grandmothers and my aunts uh, about the myriad of local farms, uh, what it was like to travel to Christmas Eve on a horse-drawn sleigh, uh, or hear Eleanor Roosevelt speak at the Red Church in Tivoli, New York. In addition, as a history teacher, I constantly work with my students uh, about the placement of women in American history, and really world history, and discuss with them why women have been left out of some of the most important stories about the development of our great nation. Do any of you uh, know perhaps why it is that women have been historically left out? Or any thoughts? They're written by men. Yeah. <laughs> no offense, Matt. I'm really glad that you're here. Uh, That's why there's no men here. They were considered chattel, weren't they? Absolutely. Um, history technically was always about war, making money, making inventions, uh, and apparently there was no place for women. So my job in my classroom, and as uh, someone I'd like to maybe one day think of it as a historian, is uh, to put women in the picture. So, after working on some bicentennial project with my students, I began to wonder more about the role that women played in the history of our town. Did women hold a significant place in the local factories? What was it like to be a young woman growing up in Red Hook? Did women have to take the place of their male loved ones during World War I and II? Were area women involved in the suffrage movement? So I decided to do some research, which leads me to being here today. I'm very thankful to be able to be here today and share with you what I've learned so far in my discoveries. This project has allowed me to step back in time, to picture what our rural historic town once looked like and meant to people. 
I was fortunate to read about how they lived, to see glimpses of how they looked, and attempt to comprehend how they felt growing up in our quaint town. Fortunately and unfortunately, towns change over time. Red Hook's residents have worked to preserve its rich history and early American charm, but through technological development and population growth, the history sometimes disappears or gets lost. My attempt today is to share with you what hasn't been lost, and perhaps to encourage you to go on your own quest to unleash some bit of history within our community or of your own familial histories. Today's talk is not about these women, Margaret Beekman Livingston and Margaret Rebecca Astor, really fabulous women in history, but um, this isn't my focal point. Uh, instead, my focal point are about these women, uh, a Mrs. James Baxter, a, a women like Mrs. Philip uh, Fredenberg and these school friends. And uh, this one I'm gonna pass around. Um, this is, many of you may have seen in the bicentennial calendar. I, I laminated this one because it's kind of close to the heart. This is my great grandmother here. Um, and this is from um, the Gum Montgomery Place Orchard. So I wanted to focus on those women. You know, you may never hear their names. You may not know who they are, but I feel like, no offense, uh, uh, <laughs> they made the, the most character and um, accomplishments in our town. So I'll just pass that around if you haven't seen it. I feel like one of the most amazing things about Red Hook's history is the number of families who trace their existence back several generations. I feel it really says something about our town. I thought it would be interesting to, chart, to start with the businesses um, or factories um, in Red Hook. Some of you might know that Red Hook was actually formed from Rhinebeck on June 2nd, 1812. However, around the mid-19th century, Red Hook began to develop quite differently from neighboring Rhinebeck. Besides the tobacco factory, the town reported twice as many industrial and commercial operations as Rhinebeck in, in 1850 and 1870. <coughs> Main industries were farming, dairying, apple growing, baker chocolate factory, carpet, yarn, wool factory, and the tobacco factory. Red Hook had 24 manufacturing businesses ranging from mills, blacksmiths, small wagon, and carrying carriage making shops that employed between two and four workers to the relatively large tobacco employing between 40 and 50. Now my first question to myself in, in reading all those statistics is what happened? Where are all the industries, and we could get into a whole political discussion I'm sure, uh, about where those businesses went, but uh, I, I felt that it was kind of sad. This just shows the population growth between 1840 and uh, 1980. There was a little bit of a decrease between 1890 and 1930, uh, and evidence shows that that's people moving out to Poughkeepsie. Um, it's interesting, you know, every time that we think we need to go to the store um, for something big, we go across the river. Well, that didn't happen here until the 1950s. Everybody either went to Hudson or Poughkeepsie, or really stayed very centrally located in Red Hook. Okay, so the first uh, building in industry is the tobacco factory. Uh, 1850s to the 1930s, this was up and running. Uh, the street that's just south of, in the village is Tobacco Lane, and this is where uh, the tobacco factory sat. The tobacco industry in Red Hook was established by the Massano family. In 1850, they started out with 12 acres, and it jumped to 17,520 acres for tobacco. In general, cigars cost a, um, a lot in the labor. So guess who did the labor? <laughs> Women. Um, to keep costs low, they went to towns like rural Red Hook, and they employed women. In 1850, the factory operated by J. and P. Hendricks employed 30 men and 8 women to work 10-hour days, with women earning an average of $12 a month and men earning 20 This is telling as it fits with the national story of the disparity amongst female and male wage earners. Some would argue, and have proven, that it is true to some extent today, women still earn less than the man's dollar. Um, at the factory, Robert Livingston Massano started the practice of reading aloud to workers who would sit and roll tobacco into cigars. I found that pretty interesting. Many of these workers were women, with the heavier jobs of cutting and the packing and drying went to men. Some women were employed to roll cigars at the home for piecework. The factory produced one million cigars in 1850 and 200,000 pounds of chewing tobacco under the brand names of Red Hook, Deerhead, Yellow Spot, and Eagle. The business continued to be a major employer in the village and produced chewing and smoking tobacco and snuff until the 1930s. 
there were, were records of three to four generations who worked in this, these factories. Um, it operated for almost 90 years. And as you can see, my trend, hopefully, by the end, is that women were present in this uh, industry. And here's a, I, I feel like this is kind of a neat logo of some of the tobacco. We always talk about buying local. It was so easy back then. <laughs> The next is the chocolate factory, and this one is in Annandale. It was constructed in 1898 and then moved to what we know as a chocolate factory today. My son, fortunate enough to attend uh, preschool there. In 1898, William H. Baker produced chocolate and cocoa at the factory in Annandale, employing 25 men and 14 women, along with five girls under the age of 21. By 1900, they had moved to Red Hook Village and switched from water power to steam power. So Red Hook change over time is uh, meeting the needs of technology. The company built its new factory right next to the railroad, taking advantage of the faster transport system and the railroad line uh, many of you know now as the Hucklebush. In 1913, it employed 79 adults and three children under the age of 16. It stayed in operation until the 1920s, producing baking chocolate and cocoa using the milk from local dairy farms, a perfect combination. Baker's chocolate was known all around, and in our town it appeared to be considered a special treat, as well as sometimes something to stay away from. So, um, two different diaries and, um, that I was fortunate to read. One was by Agnes Losey Clark, and the other one was by um, a Mary Bud. And if some of you may have um, read the book by Agnes Clark, um, Dutch, date, Dutch Days, and uh, her father, who was a local doctor, told her to refrain from eating any of the chocolate. She was so obsessed with the chocolate, she wanted to get the scraps that um, one of her classmates would bring. And she said, you can ride my sleigh, you can do whatever you want, just bring, in, bring me in your chocolate. And I think one day she ate too much of it uh, and got sick from it. And my mom told me a story about her mother, who worked in the chocolate factories, and she said, you know, you never eat any of the chocolate-covered cherries if you knew uh, what they were made of. Now, in playing the his historian attempting role, I was thinking, okay, so before the progressive era, before reforms in how to uh, how factories should be run, uh, they'd open the windows, right? And cherries, what, what likes cherries but the crows, my grandmother would say, and they'd try to go in and get the um, crows, and not every time were you able to pick out worms or what other, whatever other things that crows might drop. So, yeah, every time. We had a box of chocolate covered cherries in the house on a holiday. My mom would say, don't eat them. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's an image um, from the Maynard Ham collection here at the archives. And it shows a great representation of the women who came out to work, who had to work um, <clears throat> to supplement their family income. Yes, men, and even some children on the, on the far right. <clears throat> Something that always uh, intrigued me too with old photos, even the paint, uh, portraits I talk about in my class, you know, if you're spending the money and you're sitting, it wasn't appealing to, to show a huge grin like when we take pictures today, but in old photographs, you know, they, they look like they're really loving their job at the chocolate factory. <laughs> <laughs> no one ever smiled. <laughs> no. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't think anyone's smiling there. No. Second row of the And uh, here's when it was built in uh, Red Hook, and just at the turn of the century. And the top images, um, I just picking up my son the other day. You know what? Another thing that I feel happens when we grow up in a town and we spend so much time driving here, and then we never really look at things. We never really try to capture the history or the little details that, that add so much charm and, and charisma. But um, in picking him up the other day, I saw that sign on the chocolate factory and I was like, that's awesome. That's, 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 that's old. That's ancient. That's perfect. Um, and then I found this as well in the archives that there was an article looking for girls to work in the chocolate factory. So again, um, historical proof from a local newspaper that they were looking for women to be employed. And today, the chocolate factory, used for um, quite a variety of businesses, which is great. Keeping up with the charm, but yet utilizing it for uh, local space. And if we don't need another industry to add, violets 
were huge in this area, which um, I found to be really interesting. And I feel like a lot of people have forgotten about it. Um, Red Hook shared the nickname Violet Capital of the World with Rhinebeck. Violet houses were scattered around the village in backyards and on side streets. This little delicate flower was fashionable at the turn of the century. And as you can see, perhaps you're in, there used to be boards and women um, and men. Uh, another job that was kind of perfect, they said, for women um, to lay across the boards and to pick uh, a very I feel tedious task because they're uh, a pretty delicate flower. <coughs> uh, cultivating sweet violets were brought to the Hudson River from England. Um, the Mid-Hudson Valley was a perfect location for growing violets for several reasons. Easy access to the major markets of New York City via train, um, enough seasonal labor, mainly by women and uh, young teenagers, and an abundant supply of fresh, fresh soil which was replenished in the greenhouses each year. At its peak, Red Hook had 350,000 square feet of greenhouses, belonging to 40 different growers. Milan and Poughkeepsie were also home to numerous violet, far violet farms, and Rhinebeck boasted 115 <coughs> growers. They were picky, to, they were picky um, or tricky to pick, because every possible foot or space inside the greenhouse had to be planted. Aisles between the raised beds were narrow. In order to reach the back of the beds, pickers rested narrow, on narrow wooden boards uh, on the heating pipes at the far side of the edge. Um, there's all kinds of speculation as to why the violet industry declined. Um, women's fashion changed. Uh, it wasn't necessarily, uh, also during wartime, you couldn't go spend your money on a beautiful corsage. It wasn't, it didn't seem fitting. You weren't supporting your government. So uh, you rationed and what did you do away with but a pretty corsage. Corsa corsage. Um, there's also talk about uh, a Broadway play and some uh, scandals with how violets were looked at and being represented. Um, I'm sure you may be aware um, a book written by Kathy Leonard um, mentions the violet industry called, a, and the book is called A Violet Season. So as I continue my local research, I hope to dive into that book. And this is just a, another image showing the local railroad. Some houses pretty scattered, but <coughs> notice the long greenhouses. So in uh, sharing with you the tobacco factory, the chocolate factory, and the violet industry, now uh, I'd like to turn it to St. Margaret's, <coughs> certainly involving women. Uh, it was in operation from 1852 to 1937. It was a home um, overall to about 130 young girls, some orphaned, some surrendered by parents who could no longer afford to keep them. Uh, thanks to Margaret Armstrong Astor, and that's when I showed you the image in the beginning, um, Mrs. Astor came from a very wealthy family. Um, and in 1851, she persuaded her husband, William Astor, to build uh, her an orphanage. Uh, her husband said, do you want a greenhouse or do you want an orphanage? And she picked the orphanage. <laughs> she was a very religious and an avid, avid gardener. Um, and many of you may know their estate is at Rokeby. Her idea was to provide a good home with religious education for poor girls who were orphans. Um, there was an Episcop Episcopal deaconess who ran the house. They devoted their life to the work of the Epi Episcopal Church. At one point, records showed... Um, the home was called a school, and the girls were called scholars. I found that to be kind of interesting. Uh, the teachers were hired at the home to instruct the girls in various skills. Um, later on, however, the name changed, and the girls were called inmates and residents. <laughs> <laughs> Big difference. Um, girls varied from their locations. Some were born in Red Hook, some Fishkill, Brooklyn, New York City, England, Ulster County, Rhinebeck, Connecticut, Madeline, and Hudson. Uh, sometimes they were surrendered by the county child welfare or in superintendent of the poor, or it showed that they were just neglected by their mother or father. Um, interesting, most of them had a Protestant or religious background. Uh, one of the young women came from the Hudson Orphanage, and because it reported it, she is too old for the Hudson Asylum and needs general training in housework. Um, it showed that in 1915, a girl died from scarlet fever. Uh, uh, Maynard Ham and Clara Carr interviewed one of the last um, uh, scholars 
who attended St. Margaret's, Edna Hunt um, Ordamo. And she was born in 1910, one of five children. Her father had died young, and she was brought to St. Margaret's with her sister at eight years old. Uh, she claims even to that day it was very hard to leave her mother. She would wait uh, to look out the window for her mother when she would come next. So in this instance, it wasn't just uh, an orphan if your mother and father both died. If one of your parents couldn't support you, then you would have, sometimes you'd, they'd send you to the orphanage. She'd walk to school every day, uh, District 4, which is today's old soap factory. She uh, mentions that it was very sad every day that she had to walk back to the orphanage where the other boys and girls um, weren't, were able to go home. Her mother would visit here and there from Poughkeepsie. Um, she hated to see her go. There were hired men there to take care of animals. The girls would weed and feed the chickens. They learned cooking, canning, baking. They sang in the choir at the local church. Sometimes they were able to go on a picnic or to a lyceum show. Um, she remembers horse and wagon rides. There was very little car traffic um, at the turn of the century, early 1900s, and she would watch the traffic pass by. Mrs. Um, Aldridge, Mrs. Margaret Aldridge, would make Christmas huge, and she would bring a big tree, and everybody would get presents. Um, from 1929 to 1934, the, um, the orphanage was closed, and then from 34 to 37, it operated as a welfare home. And then in 87 to 91, it was leased to a multi-county community development where um, it served 14-year-old young adults who had chemical dependency issues. Um, I'd like to share with you a letter when it was St. Margaret's that was written to the Episcopal Bishop of New York in 1891. This is just really quick, and it, it, again, it gets at the women aspect. Dear Bishop Potter, since seeing you, I have learned some things about the moral atmosphere of Red Hook, the village on the outskirts of which St. Margaret stands, which makes me feel that the lady I mentioned to you is too young and inexperienced to take the position as matron of the house. She could very well take, the, take that of a teacher, but the matron and teacher are the only grown persons in the establishment. I write this to ask you if you know of any middle-aged, experienced, and active women whom you thought fitted for the post. I feel the responsibility of finding a new matron as much as I appreciate the difficulty of doing so. For from wandering life of the last five years, I have been quite out of touch with middle-aged spinsters or widows and don't know where to look for them. <laughs> On that chance of you knowing a suitable matron, I give you the following particulars. Now get this. The salary is between two and three hundred dollars a year. I've not got the figures, but about two hundred and forty dollars a year, I believe. There are 12 girls in the house ranging from 6 to 16. The children are either half orphans or full orphans and are taken from the neighborhood or elsewhere if the supply in the neighborhood falls short. The object of the house is to build the girls as servants and they and, they, and the matron and teachers do all the work in the house. The work is divided according to age and the strength of the girls. The house is large, warm and comfortable and in thorough repair. It is a brick building on the rising ground with an acre or so of grass about it and a fine view of the Catskills in front of the land. I mentioned fully capable of doing her share of work, cooking and other domestic duties of the house. The Reverend Jan John Lambert, our clergyman, is chaplain to the house and overlooks the religious training of the girls. The church is about three quarters of a mile from the house and the matron should walk with the children and teach once every Sunday. In closing, I shall touch on the unsavory subject I opened my letter with, the moral or immoral atmosphere of the village. <laughs> he brings up an incident where uh, the priest supposedly was accused of drinking whiskey at a local bar, even though he went in to close it. He said that um, several ladies of my acquaintances are afraid to go out in the evening for fear of physical violence. No woman is pure enough to be above the reach of their lying tongues unless she is of middle aged and so feel and shut off from contact with the village life that scandal would be ridiculous. It was this part which made me change my mind and feel that the matron must be middle-aged. My authority, by the way, is absolutely trustworthy. I've consulted both women and men, seeing, seeing you, perhaps who knew Red Hook, for I didn't. A, prom a prominent citizen seduced the daughter of another rich and prominent citizen a few feet from the church. My informant had it on the rectory steps. That, of course, might occur anywhere, but the local moral ebb of the community is shown from the fact that the but the black ground never even had the grace to leave the town. I mention these scandalous facts to show you of what vital importance, firmness, and worldly experience are in the position of matron position from society. 
the matron and teacher would be entirely cut off from the position from that society. And he just closes. I found that to be an interesting primary source there. <laughs> <laughs> So that's St. Margaret's today, and um, kudos to all of those who really went out to try to preserve St. Margaret's. It's a phenomenal job, really. Um, I, I hope that it stays that way, and I, I hope uh, everybody can recognize that what work went in and that it's not a Hannaford parking lot or a storage spot for Hannaford. Um, so I told you uh, Dutch, uh, Dutch County Days by Agnes Clark was a great book that um, is out there. I don't know if anybody's had the ability to read it, but it's about this woman, um, or young child pictured here, Agnes Losey, who lived in Upper Red Hook. Now, to me, uh, Tivoli, Lower Red Hook, Upper Red Hook, the village of Red Hook, is sort of Berrytown, is sort of Red Hook. I mean, some Tivoli people may not see it that way. But um, <laughs> during, sh the book focuses on about 1902 to 1929, and um, er these early years, Upper Red Hook was really removed from Lower Red Hook, where we are today. Um, and this book is great. It just gives a very detailed uh, setting of what her life was like as a young child, from uh, becoming a woman to um, sleigh riding, to going to school, to being mischievous with her uh, classmates, to loving her parents. Um, so I have a couple excerpts I'd like to share with you, but this is, a, I thought, a great picture with her, this dollhouse. Um, in the, in the story, she wrote to Santa and really wanted this meticulous dollhouse, but I think one of the hired men built it, and she, she opened it up, and in the book she said, oh, I guess I wasn't a good girl this year. But she didn't really get the beautiful dollhouse that she had wanted. Um, <clears throat> some things that I, I pulled from the book that I, I found to be really interesting. Um, she used to make trips with her mother and father. Again, I said her father was the doctor. They would have ear trumpets, if you couldn't hear. Um, my grandfather's very hard of hearing, and I can only imagine if he had to put a, one of those old-fashioned ear trumpets up to his ear. Um, there were two big churches in Upper Red Hook, a Dutch Reform and Episcopal. The bell, uh, the bell of the church tower would ring when there was a birth. Um, her father would go and, of course, deliver. They had a hired woman who I found to be really intriguing. Um, her name was <laughs> Serena, and again, a great connection is that Serena came from the St. Margaret's Orphanage. So she went up to um, a lot of the women who left the orphanage, worked in the local area. Something that Serena, her, um, the housekeeper, <coughs> said that she would threaten Agnes if she didn't eat her oatmeal, that an Indian would come and scalp her. <laughs> and uh, she's, uh, Agnes claims that she never saw a Native American, so there was a, a stereotype there for sure. She talks about wanting real shad from the Hudson as opposed to canned. Um, at three, she was so excited she didn't have to uh, read, have diapers anymore. Um, her, she remembers her family having a portable kerosene heater. She remembers her father along with um, Mr. Astor being the first in Dutchess County to own a car. She was, she was not allowed to go sledding on Sundays, I thought was interesting, because those were only for Dutch reform parishioners. Her on the Episcopal side were uh, not allowed to go sledding on uh, Sundays. She hated the trip to a, the dentist. And she recalls her first time to the dentist. Uh, but get this, the dentist took her to get an ice cream soda <laughs> before <laughs> killing the nerve in the tooth. Wow, wish our dentist did that now. Uh, I mentioned before her father did not like her eating uh, chocolate. She thought that he would get <coughs> sick from the scraps. Um, outhouses back then were called privies. Um, they were told never to use the school privy and never to drink the water from the water pump because of typhoid fever. At school, she would recite the Pledge of Allegiance in the 23rd Psalm. Only boys, though, were able to play horseshoes, and she didn't like that very much. She tried to take some from her local friend's blacksmith shop, uh, but wasn't, was not successful. She did like to play with uh, paper dolls. She remembers when a telephone um, was established in the house. She remembers receiving the Sears Roebuck catalog. Um, she mentions the growing growth of violets. She went on call to the Redmond Estate. Um, her father actually went on a trip with him to care for what they, he, called, they were, he was called a count to Paris, um, and the father went on a, a trip with him. I found interesting, um, as far as like archaeological history, that her brother found um, up by Spring Lake a Revolutionary War cannon. So again, the rich history that is really surrounds us, and I feel like we forget or we have we uh, lose sight of. Uh, she remembers experiencing World War One. 
she, uh, they would wear a, a ribbon and in the center would be a blue star and a round, um, a, much like they, they, we have today hanging in our homes. Her mother would sold, sold Liberty Bonds and worked for the Red Cross. She remembers seeing soldiers leaving from Upper Red Hook and headed down the old post road. So this is the Losey family sledding. Like I said, she did like to do that, but not on Sundays um, in Upper Red Hook. The other person that I, uh, and I love this picture, the very patriotic flag. Um, the other person I was able to read about was Mary Budd. She had a diary that the, is, that's upstairs in the archives. And it was a very um, everyday, nothing big happening. Every, um, she wrote from January 1921 to October 1929. And this is Mary Budd and her family. Um, I, I would say on the upper scale, a uh, relatively well-established family. However, she still um, <clears throat> would buy her own fabric to make clothes. She was able to go off to college. She met uh, President Harding in the White House. She would go to basketball games, dances, made her own dresses, baked, ironed, went to uh, lots of movies, shows at the Bardavan. She remembers her family getting sick with measles. She used to like to listen to the fight of Jack Dempsey and Jean Tummy, um, um, the big fight. Her grandmother had a stroke and uh, was sent to Vassar Hospital. She, um, again, must have not been a big attraction for many to go to the <laughs> dentist, not that it is today, but she remembers, uh, she said they had to get a nerve killed. Uh, she stresses the importance of letter writing, and I feel that's something else that's lost in our society. We have such the need to, for that instant gratification from a text, from an email, and people would wait weeks to get a letter. <coughs> and another great connection that I was able to uh, discover was that Mary Bud and Agnes Losey became best of friends. So uh, once Upper Red Hook and Lower Red Hook sort of came together with schools, they became uh, great friends, and this is them swimming up at Spring Lake. Uh, this is Mary Bud's graduation. Again, a great day, but not very many smiles. Beautiful looking women with bouquets and gorgeous dresses, but not very many smiles. Graduation from where? Uh, Briarcliff College. Oh, okay. Uh, just getting at it quickly, and I, I'd like to pass around. Um, I had a great conversation with Janice Lawson, um, and these are um, war ration books from World War II, if anybody, obviously please be careful with them, but just check them out, what rationing was all about, if you'd like to see. Um, this is from World War I, but just in speaking, joining together World War I and World War II, um, women were really involved, and in the women of Red Hook fit quite perfectly in the national scene of women during World War I and II. They would um, participate in the Red Cross, buy war bonds, plant liberty gardens, um, and a ration. Uh, one of those books is actually uh, from a young, uh, a young three-year-old, I think, uh, or maybe even younger, actually had to get a ration book. And I guess it made sense because if they were eating, they were uh, having to purchase food. Uh, Mrs. Lawson remembers that those were really only used for gas. Um, petroleum was big. Uh, and anything that you couldn't produce yourself. The families were still very self-sufficient in this area during uh, World War I and II. Um, something I feel that Red, Red Hook has lost um, is the hotel. I've heard uh, lots of stories from family about the character and charm of the Red Hook Hotel. This is a very early image. There's another one. I, I, I know I can't... And it's not their fault, but I can't help to look at the extra mark and just be like, why, really? Uh, I'd much rather, I'd much rather uh, see that or go into what was called the elbow room. It was a local tavern and have a drink as opposed so to buying a, <laughs> as opposed to buying a Gatorade at the extra mark. Um, but this is how it's, you know, it's changed, it changed over the year. Chicken dinner, I guess, was very big. Um, but what attracted people through Red Hook was that the Taconic only came so far and it, and it encouraged people to get off at Lafayetteville or Rock City. And in order to go north to Albany, you'd have to go off the old post road or over the Rip Van Winkle Bridge. So of course you're gonna stop at 
the elbow room for refuel. Um, just check out some of the local shops and uh, suck in some of the charm. This I thought was great. Um, so how much does it cost for you guys to go out to lunch or dinner? Not 10 bucks, right? Uh, unless it's a McDonald's, yuck. But um, here, check out some of the prices. Uh, for a dollar, you could have fresh hot turkey, um, or perhaps Briarcliff baby beef steak for two, for $4. Um, and desserts rain, you know, 50 cents for a hot turkey sandwich, or a steak sandwich for 75 cents. I thought that was another neat. This is one of the last images of the hotel. It burnt in, 19, in the 1960s from a fire, and then it was never fully restored in the kitchen. I thought this was great. Um, these are some of the women who would work. Um, I called, I had a con another conversation with Margaret Doty, who uh, remembers working as a waitress in uh, the hotel. Again, women are on the scene here. This is, I just I wanted to throw it in. Um, again, very big in our town is Memorial Day Parade. We bring, um, we remember those veterans uh, and we always have a great parade. And uh, I thought this was a great picture, drum corps. Um, the Historical Society of Upper Red Hook. I thought this was really intriguing. I, I came across this in um, Reverend Leonard's new book. Um, the Historical Society of Red Hook, uh, or of Upper Red Hook, was a group of women, um, you know, of only the well-to-do women. Um, they would join, uh, at first started, it was called the Monday Club, and they would, they would join and uh, read things, beginning really with the Netherlands, um, and then branching out to other areas of the world, um, they try to read literature and, and perhaps engage in um, other conversations about what was going on. But these I thought were some great quotes. You had to be somebody or know somebody to be asked into what was considered in the first half of the 20th century to be a closed club. Dr. E.K. Lousy of Upper Red Hook, um, the men have often wished for a club like ours but there has never been one brave enough to attempt it. They seem quite satisfied with the annual Forest Thief Club. Um, all ladies, they were usually the wives of well-off farmers and professional men. They were civic-minded, politically and socially conservative, and overwhelming um, Dutch reformed. They were impressive ladies who met to be progressive and promote education and enlightenment in this rural place. The, um, their mandate in quote, was a study of worldwide subjects. They were allowed more, no more than 30 members. Their responsibilities rotated. Half served as hostess. hostess. Um, the other half presented written papers. It was invitation only. Until the 1950s, the club was restricted to Upper Red Hook's residents only. According to Mrs. Gallagher, you came dressed in hat and white gloves, never smoked, and the papers um, could run well over an hour. There were substantial refreshments from cream chicken biscuits, Finger sandwiches, tea was served in silver teapots. Tradition remains important to this historical club where at least two members represented their family's third generation to the membership getting at that so many generations exist in, in um, our town. The club studied Holland, Italy, America, Germany, England, the Near East, Spain, travels in Europe, Dutchess County, and English literature. There are guest speakers and get this. So, one person that they really had to have lots of discussions about and went back and forth, should we ask her, should we welcome her, we do. Any guesses? Eleanor Roosevelt. Yeah, Eleanor Roosevelt. Well, they um, extended the invitation, she took it, and she became an honorary member. Um, if you were invited to become a member of the Upper Red Hook Historical Society, that was no small thing. And there's a, a picture of the surviving ladies at their 40th anniversary of the club. Awesome. I'd love to be a fly on the wall in one of those meetings. <laughs> love it. Love it. Do you know who they were? I do have a, a list of the, would you like me to read it out? Yeah. 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 The front, Mrs. Harry Arnold, Miss Mary Curley, Mrs. E.K. Lousy. Jenny Fulton, second row, Mrs. F. Palmer Hart, Mrs. O.T. Oh, oh, yeah. 
<laughs> Mrs. O.T. Cookingham. Mrs. Harvey Losey. Mrs. George Hubbard. Third row, Mrs. William Boyce. Mrs. Raymond Brenzel. Mrs. Gordon Mead. Mrs. Laura Lawrence and Mrs. Charles Gallagher. <laughs> um, to add to the industry, there was a pie factory, uh, which is currently today uh, the MAT building for the Bard College Masters in Teaching program. Uh, there used to be a pie factory there, uh, and these are the women who used to work there. Again, I uh, noticed the, the factories, um, there's a change. There, this is all predominantly women, so um, the idea of the roles of what women do outside of the home are changing. More women are going out to work in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Yeah, still cooking. This is inside the pie factory. Something that brought a little slice of fame to Red Hook for her famous um, cherry pie. I thought this was quite neat. Um, uh, Patty Marjorie Campbell submitted a um, recipe to Women's Day, and it won 1955 Championship Cherry Pie Recipe. So hurry up and write it down if anybody wants a cherry pie recipe. <laughs> Um, and this picture hits real close to home. I feel like um, this is uh, something that has made me love our town, love the history of our town. Uh, and that's my grandmother, second one from the right. Uh, she worked in the local school. Can you recite who was there at the table, please? I honestly don't know, sir. Uh, other than the second woman, the beautiful woman, a little biased to the uh, second from the right is my grandmother, Catherine Gusky. Yeah. And but next to her was Loretta Martin. Yeah, that, that would be Loretta. Jeff Martin, yeah. right. his grandmother. grandmother. Mm -hmm. And the other three ladies is Viola Hitchcock, I right. think is the lady with the glasses. Mm -hmm. And Mrs. Kip. Yes, the one over here, but I forget the next one. School cafeteria. Right. <laughs> At the Linden Avenue, yep. And it was all prepared uh, from scratch. Mm -hmm. I think I have one of her old mixing bowls that she used there. Great picture. And look, uh, just as a side note, look how, look how well dressed they are and well kept their hair. Their, starched aprons there. So some thoughts uh, to close from those that lived it. Emma Kuhn remembers a quieter, more peaceful Red Hook in those days when residents of the town were more insular and self-sufficient. She adds, it's a, it's a shame that so much has been lost and that in the name of progress, some things have become more important than others. According to Janice Lawson, the biggest change she thought was definitely the bridge. Kingston wasn't an option before. And Margaret Doherty claims that the biggest change occurred due to the population increases. So in conclusion, in conclusion, to answer some of my original questions, yes. Women played an active role in the development of our town, both economically, socially, and culturally. Their roles in our small rural community run parallel with the story of American women around the country. They were members of the Red Cross, used ration books, worked in a variety of local industries, all while maintaining their roles as daughters, wives, and mothers. I just shared a lot of information with you, so um, I hope to continue my research. Um, I feel like I've only kind of scratched the surface. So thanks to me all. all. If you have good. any questions or comments, I'd be happy to attempt them. Thanks. Thank Uh, I feel like it. Um, there was, I guess, different periods where there was an influx of people coming up from uh, that probably went hand in hand with the immigration uh, influx from 1880 to 1920. There was a big wave of immigrants. So, um, like my grandmother, 
they came um, to this area for farming. Farming was huge, so you couldn't really f uh, farm on the outskirts of the city, so you'd push up the Hudson. Um, as far as women are concerned, I think that same thing. Women were probably really involved uh, as well in the city. An urban setting versus a rural setting, a little different, perhaps how you lived, where you lived, um, and the factories, but I think nonetheless probably the same. <coughs> I didn't catch which school did you teach at? I teach at the Red Oak High School. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. In your uh, experience as a teacher, how do you see the role of women in Red Oak today? And the <laughs> next generation? Very progressive. Um, well, um, I. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Supervisor is a woman. Oh, absolutely, and she's spoken in my uh, women's studies. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I really try to bring, regardless of if it's a world history or my women's studies class, I try to relate it to everybody and bring it home to all involved, male and female. So um, this is a great century, a great uh, decade for women to be involved and equal and think that they're equal. So. Um, I'm fortunate to, enough to have one of my students here today, so I must be making some kind of impact. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Did you see any facts of any women running for office in that period you were looking at? Uh, no, I did not, but I um, would like to add that during the um, fight for the suffrage movement, the uh, 19th Amendment granting women the right to vote, there was a parade and there were six women who uh, marched from Poughkeepsie all the way up to Albany and stopped and actually stayed right here at the Elmendorf Inn and then went, marched a little bit further and got refueled, they said, at uh, Upper Red Hook and then carried on to um, Albany. So I didn't catch any, I'll keep digging, but I didn't catch any people running for local office. Sidebar, my mother ran for the school board, I believe it was about 1948 or nine. And did she succeed? Was she successful? <laughs> no, I think you should look at a 1950 yearbook and see who the school uh. <laughs> I think Albert Curley was on the board, um. among others. Men in three pieces. So that's it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you.